Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and this video we're breaking down episode 8 of The Last of Us. This is the one I've been waiting for, and David in the game's one of the most memorable characters that you come across when playing. Voiced by Nolan North, he started off as an apparent ally, but as you began to learn more about him, you start to see his more sinister side. Though Bloders, Clickers and the Infected were terrifying, I think one of the scariest things for me was playing as Ellie and moving about the restaurant as he walked around wielding a machete. Normally, boss characters in games are gigantic monsters or highly skilled characters, but there was just something so unnerving about a creepy 50 year old cannibal walking around looking for you. Now as is with all Last of Us episodes, the fact that we aren't playing the game means that they can show things from the perspective of others. In the PlayStation counterpart, you are locked to the POV of Joel and Ellie, whereas here we can see more of David's backstory. That's how we begin as well, and we open by looking over his town which is called Silver Lake in both the show and game. We discover David has taken it upon himself to become a holy man and over the top of this we hear him narrating Revelation 21. His opening line discusses the new heaven and new earth and this very much reflects a new world that they've found themselves in the midst of. The verses in this chapter talk about how there'll be no need for a physical temple in this new world because God's presence will be everywhere. We then jump to see him hitched up in Todd's steakhouse to watch him delivering a sermon. Todd's restaurant was what it was called in the game, and it's been transformed into a makeshift church. We see how people have tried to find reason in what's happened to the world, and you can totally understand why someone turned to religion. I didn't want to spoil this episode all the way back in the first entry, but it's even possible that Mrs. Adler could have foreshadowed people going like this. Well, that's true every day, isn't it? People out there need to get right with Jesus. Now, religion beyond things spiritually also acts as a way to explain things. For example, thousands of years ago people didn't understand how the world was formed but religions gave these answers whilst also outlining the best ways to live. Thus people flocked towards them because science hadn't given alternatives. I'm trying to explain this as best as possible as I can without offending people but basically what I'm trying to say is that in this once more stripped back world you can see why people would end up becoming religious. A lot of people don't have the scientific tools to answer things and thus preachers could provide the answers and comfort to those that feel lost. A Revelations is about the end of the world and thus it's easy to see why so many people would turn to this and David after the world had ended. It hasn't been all sunshine and rainbows though and due to long hot winters, David has had to resort to cannibalism in order to keep people alive. You see a sign hanging up saying when we are in need he shall provide and this is playing on Philippines 419 which states God will provide for people. This sign is also pulled over to the game and when Ellie fights David in the restaurant we can actually see this sign hanging up at the back of the room. Now he's had to cross a line in order to provide but David's hidden this from the people whereas in the game I always kind of got the impression that the townsfolk were aware. Now you might be wondering why they don't just move somewhere warm. Well the fact is that people here feel safe and they very much control their society. They're not oppressed by Fedra and the infected also tended to stick to warmer areas. Though you did encounter some in the snow when you first met David, the second game showed that the exposure to the elements left them completely frozen. You also discover that every time they bunkered down that the raiders eventually showed up and thus they had to find somewhere that wasn't too appealing to others. So Salt Lake is probably the best place to be, though the cruel winters have meant that food becomes scarce. Now interesting little tidbit for you mate, did you know that Vikings called it Iceland because it would put invaders off from going there? They called Greenland that because it was covered in ice and thus when invaders arrived there they'd be like f sake. Anyway he goes to comfort a young girl there by saying that after pain God will make it so there's no more sorrow. We learn this girl has just lost her father and that they want to bury him but the ground is too cold. David calls himself her father and it's very much a perverted version of the dad and daughter relationship that Joel has with Ellie. Whereas Joel will do anything to protect Ellie, David smacks her in front of people and they're very much surrogate fathers at opposite ends of the scale. Anyway, I'm getting the word... Nuts. Yes, David is one of them and I think that's what made the character in the game so creepy. I think this is obviously commenting on controversy surrounding the church and going to be difficult not to offend people but it's definitely an important thing to address. The entire holy man thing with David is something that wasn't present in the game and I think it adds a whole new dimension to him when he's this creepy religious figure that eats people and preys on children. At this point we get a quick cut of his right hand man James and in case you don't recognise him, that's Troy Baker. He actually played Joel in the game and Baker gave this seminal performance that I think actually helped out with a lot of the success of The Last of Us. He's a very beloved voice actor, he's played lots of different iconic characters and I have to say that I think he completely knocked it out of the park. 
Now, so far on the show, we've had Marlene's voice actor playing her in the series, Tommy's popped up as Perry, and now Baker is playing James. All that's left is Ellie's Ashley Johnson, so I can imagine that she'll be popping up next for the finale. There are rumours about who she could be playing, but we'll not spoil that here. Should change the name to Not Much of a Spoiler, mate. L- like the video. Anyway, Baker actually looks a lot like Joel does in the game, and hey, as much as I love Pedro, I wouldn't have minded him playing him in live action too. Look, I'm not trying to offend people <laughs> again, and outside we hear how dire of a situation they're in when it comes to rations. In the game, we never saw this side of things, and after Joel fell off his horse at the university, you then cut to Ellie hunting. And whilst you were doing this, you noticed a bark that you then shot an arrow in. This didn't kill it, and thus you tracked it through the environment, trying to take it out for food. It fled to an abandoned factory, which is when you found it dead, and at this point, James and David step forward. Now here we see the other side of it, with James and David talking about how some of their spotters saw a deer the other day. You see how their paths now cross from both sides, and also explore the doubt within James. He's clearly wrestling with the fact that they're crossing the line in order to keep going and adds a lot of complexity to the character that wasn't originally there. He was pretty much just an NPC with a couple of lines, but here Baker fleshes him out so we get much more of his thoughts. Now this cannibalism in the snow could be a reference to the Donna Party, who were a group of American pioneers that migrated to California from the Midwest. They got stuck in a snowy mountain range for a while and had to resort to cannibalism like what we see here. James is starting to doubt whether this is God's way, and it's possible he knows about the other stuff too. In the game when Joel ambushes the town, you overhear some saying that David's leadership should be put to a vote again, so this sentiment was clearly felt amongst some of the other inhabitants. In the game, you didn't really encounter any of the kids here, but you did hear a woman saying that they were moving the children to a shelter. Now in the game, James went off and David and Ellie waited for him, which is when they were both swarmed by infected. You had to make your way through the abandoned factory as they closed in, and you made your final stand against some runners, clickers, and a bloater. In the game, you had no idea what was up with David at this point, and it allowed you to build some camaraderie with him. So far in the game, though you'd fought lots of hunters, the, the people that you'd met in cutscenes had ended up becoming your allies. This was the case with Marlene, Henry and Sam, and of course, Joel's brother Tommy. It sort of lured you into this false sense of security with him, and when listening to the kind of funny podcast a couple of weeks ago, they did bring up a point that stuck with me since then. They said that Kathleen might have even heard the David reveal a bit, because we'd already experienced an evil leader figure. Though I don't know if that's fully the case, I do think having two characters like this in the show hurt the fact that David was someone you came across who was worse than the infected. You don't really trust him from the start, whereas in the game you kind of did, and I kind of feel it missed that gut punch a bit, but let me know below if it caught you off guard. This is a public service announcement, announcement, announcement. Manscaped have new beard products, and they're also going further with the Weed Whacker 2.0. Gentlemen, meet the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. It's the ultimate package that makes it even easier to craft your signature look. It all starts with a cordless electric beard hedger. The beard hedger is tough on hairs, but smooth on your face, and it has a single stroke efficiency, so you get all those hairs with one clean stroke. The waterproof cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths all with one guard, so no more messy drawers full of extra add-ons. The Pro Kit also comes with the dermatologist tested formulations for your post trim care. This includes Manscapes, beard shampoo and conditioner, beard oil, and beard balm to moisturize, style and shimmy a new beard. Plus the kit has three free gifts. It's got a beard brush, a comb and also some scissors. With a nice beard, y- your face it's perfectly groomed right? Wrong! I'll tell you why. You also have those dirty nose and ear hairs that need to get the hell out of here. The brand new Weed Whacker 2.0 offers improved blades and skin safe technology with a no tugging guarantee. It's never been so painless to mind your manholes. Now that you have your face looking great, you must try the Manscaped 4.0 performance package that now comes with the Weed Whacker 2.0. Your significant other will be delighted that you've covered all bases and you know what I'm talking about. So head over to manscaped.com slash heavy spoilers and enter the code heavy spoilers at checkout for free shipping and 20% off. That's manscaped.com slash heavy spoilers and enter the code heavy spoilers at checkout for 20% off and also free shipping. Manscaped.com slash heavy spoilers, heavy spoilers at the checkout for 20% off and also free shipping. Cheers. Now back with Ellie, we see she nurses Joel. The surroundings here are identical to the game with him being on a dirty mattress with a couple of blankets to keep him warm. We get a shot similar to the game where she examines his wound and this is something she did upon returning from David. 
Seeing how little food they have left, I did go back and forth over what the intention of this scene was. She does hold a snap of it for a second, and I even thought that she might be wondering whether it's worth giving it to him due to him being so close to death's door. I don't think that's what was intended, and I'm sure that the HBO podcast will probably clear this up. We do these videos before that's released, so I don't really get to hear things. People, yeah, some people genuinely think I watch an hour-long episode and listen to a 40-minute podcast and then make a 30-40 to 40 minute video and release it the second that the show ends, which they've discovered we, we've been using time travel, they've, they've, they've figured it out. <laughs> now, but like I said, I don't think that's the intention, and Ellie decides to mount up and go hunting. Here she comes across a rabbit, like in the game, and I, I have to play this clip again, sorry. That's the cutest fucking thing I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> Look, I'm a vegetarian, yeah, but still, it's, it's a good reaction. Now, unlike the PlayStation counterpart, Ellie's pretty useless, and whereas she was taking out animals with ease and that, we see here how she's really struggling. At this point, she comes across the deer, and similar to the game, she fails to down it. We have a moment mirroring the sniper scene from episode 6, and I did appreciate how they built off the back of that. Now, David and James come across it, and he does the typical religious preacher strategy. Okay, all I ask is 10 seconds of your time. I just want to I talk. won't say it twice! Now, let's see how these scenes play alongside those in the game. I don't see anybody. You think we can just take it? Who's there? Come out! Drop your rifles! Now! Hello? We just want to talk. Any sudden moves and I put one right between your eyes. Any sudden moves I put one right between your eyes. Ditto for Buddy Boy. Ditto for Buddy Boy over there. What do you want? Um, name's David. This here's my friend James. We're from a larger group, women, children, and we're all very, very hungry. We're from a larger group, women, children. We're all very, very hungry. So am I. Women and children, all very hungry too. Well, even so, you can't drag this back on your own. Well, uh, maybe we could uh, trade you for some of that meat there. What do you need? We're not asking for charity. We, we can trade you for some of the deer. We have, what do you need? We have... Medicine? Weapons, ammo, clothes. Medicine. Do you have any antibiotics? Like for infections. We do. Back at the camp. You're welcome to follow us. I'm back. not following you anywhere. We do. Back in our village, you're welcome to follow us. I'm not following you anywhere. Buddy boy can go get it. He comes back with what I need. The deer is all yours. Buddy boy can go get it. He comes back, you get half the deer. Anyone else shows up. You put one right between my eyes. That's right. Anyone else shows up? I put one, one right, right between my eyes. That's right. Two bottles of the penicillin in a syringe. Make it fast. Go on. Bring back two bottles in a syringe. It's not code, James. Do as I said. I'll take that rifle. Now David is well aware of who Ellie is at this point, and as we later learn, it was his men that went to the university. Either way, they go into one of the huts, which is similar to how they camped up in the game. Here we learn a bit more about David, and discover that he was a maths teacher, who converted to become a preacher after the world fell apart. Not even going to go down the rabbit hole with teaching, avoiding that, but we do learn that he came from Pittsburgh. The QZ there fell in 2017 due to a war between the Fireflies and Fedra, which is something that was sort of touched upon in the game. In the show, Ellie and Joel went to Kansas City, whereas in the source material it was Pittsburgh, where the whole Henry and Sam thing happened. You arrived there to find it overrun by bandits, and could piece together enough things to learn about what happened. Fedra had been keeping rations for themselves and starving people, and when they were ousted, the bandits rose up in their place. People like David ended up leaving, and they run into the same problem when it comes to food. 
but the dialogue in the scene starts to transform into how it plays out in the game. You know, you really shouldn't be out here all on your own. I don't like company. You know, you really shouldn't be out here all on your own. From where I'm sitting, you shouldn't be out here on your own. I see. What's your name? Why? Fair enough. So, what's your name? Look, I understand it's not easy to trust a couple of strangers. It's hard to trust strangers, I know, but I honestly mean you no harm. I'd say we make a pretty good team. We got lucky. Well, your luck had to run out sooner or later. Hmm? Luck? Lucky? No, no. No such thing as luck. Now, you see, I believe that everything happens for a reason. There's no such thing as luck. No, I, I believe everything happens for a reason. This winter, that's been especially cruel. We didn't expect this winter to be so cruel. Nothing will grow. The game's been hard to find. A few weeks back, I uh, sent a group of men out a nearby town to look for food. So I sent four of our people to a nearby town to, to scavenge what they could. Only a few came back. And only three of them came back. He said that the others had been uh, slaughtered by a crazy man. Turns out he was murdered by this crazy man. And get this, he's a crazy man traveling with a little girl. And get this, that crazy man was traveling with a little girl. You see, everything happens for a reason. You see, everything happens for a reason. No way, David. I'm not gonna let her Lower go. Lower the gun. He is the one that killed Alec, didn't she? She didn't kill anybody. Lower the gun. Now give her the medicine. The others won't be happy about this. Did you bring the medicine? Yeah, but... Throw I... it to her. David. Move the fuck out of the way. You won't survive long out there. I can't protect you. You won't survive for long out there. I can protect you. Oh, thanks. I remember experiencing this for the first time and my stomach dropped with the turn. This was a guy you just fought side by side with and had now inadvertently revealed yourself as being one of the people that caused his town so much torment. Now they've added in a layer with the person Joel killed being the father of the girl at the steakhouse and they of course are supposed to reflect Joel and Ellie. We see how the stories have changed too with Joel being described as a crazy man whereas we know from our side that they attack them. In the game, we, we never saw David and James' side after the conversation, but here we can see the doubt in him resurface once more as David lets her go. Now we return back to the house and again see things play out similar to how they do in the game. Joel? Move your arm. Here we go. Joe, where the fuck do I put this? <sighs> Sorry. You're gonna make it. Originally this was the moment that you learned Joel was alive and you'd had a large part of the game as Ellie where you had no idea what his fate was. Similar to the game Ellie lies down with him and whereas in that we cut to the morning to see David's forces coming in, here we cut to the town. There's a lot of focus given to the meat with people clearly knowing what's going on 
but they keep it to themselves because the truth's too difficult to bear. It's said to be venison, but whether that's actually true or not is another thing entirely. James does talk about supplies earlier in the episode, but we know from their interactions that they use code with each other. They could all be lying to themselves, keeping their mind off it, and it can mirror the predatory behaviour with David, but let me know what you think below. At this point, David and James arrive with a deer, and you could say they're like David James, because they saved. Ha <laughs> Bit of an English joke there, and David admits that they found who killed Alec, and he ends up slapping his daughter when she suggests killing them. It shows just how abusive that he is, and he tells the girl that he's her father now. The entire town sits in silence and allows it to happen, I think it very much shows the grip that he has over everyone. When things come out about figures like this, you'll often hear about how many people were aware of what was going on, but they turned a blind eye to it. It's very much the idea that you don't have to deal with something if you're ignorant to it, and no matter how horrific it is, you can reassure yourself that everything is okay. The reason I question this venison is because this could very much be carried over to the food too, and we get a lot of focus on the townspeople wolfing it down. They're happy to just tuck into their food, have a warm meal, and be quiet because speaking up's better than starving. Now we then jump back to Ellie, and see as Joe looks slightly better. She injects him once more, and we get a slight differentiation from the game as Ellie gets to go outside, whereas in the game she spotted people coming in from the basement. We get a great scene with David and James, with the former clearly wanting to take her, even though it will only cause problems with people back in their community. David wants to spare her because he has ulterior motives, whereas James sees it as being God's will that they should leave her to die. This very much reflects Kathleen from earlier in the season, who believed it was Sam's fate to die instead of getting the leukemia medicine. Either way, in both versions, Ali decides to head out and draw them away with us getting a big action scene. Ellie leaves Joel with a knife, and this is what he later uses to interrogate the people with. In the game, Ellie took her horse and rode through the streets as the hunters leapt out to grab her, and eventually the horse was shot and she fell down a cliffside. She then navigated the surroundings and got into a hotel, which is where she tried to escape. Here she stealthily took out hunters, and eventually was grabbed by David, which is when she was transported to the camp. Yeah, they keep the sort of energy the same, but shorten things a bit, with Ellie riding out and the horse getting shot by James. David demands that Ellie is taken and alive, and I did find it interesting how he mirrors Kathleen. Her need for revenge led to her making dumb decisions, and David's need to have Ellie leads to him doing the same thing. He stops Ellie from being shot, and even carries her away, similar to how Joel carried Sarah at the start of the season. The sick and twisted father figure is pretty much a reverse Joel, and he's arguably the most dangerous person we encounter in the whole show. Now it's, uh, that's outside of one of the other characters, but moving on. Now in the game, once Ellie's captured, we then switch perspectives to see Joel like what we get here. When you first took control, you were stumbling about and a little worse for wear, which is like how he appears here too. The tension from the scene comes from the fact that Joel is almost out of it, but he manages to get the upper hand and take down David's men. Now the death scene here is terrifying, with a lot of the struggles feeling like they're ripped right out of the game. The facial expressions especially are something that I always spin the camera around to see, and I guess we've discovered that I'm a bit of a psychopath, but please subscribe. Now from here, we get the interrogation scene. I was so happy seeing this playing out, as I was thinking that the scene with Graham Greene was going to be the show's version of it. Might have spoiled the scene for you if you watched our breakdown for that episode, but I genuinely thought that's how they were going to play it. The Disney, the Disney interrogation was how I thought they were going to play this scene. Now because they're so similar, you might be asking, why have they done something that's basically the same scene as that? Well, it's for a good reason, as here we're seeing the true side of Joel when Ellie's not around. In the cabin, we knew nothing was going to happen, as did the couple, because there was a little girl here. They were likely aware Joel wouldn't do anything, which is why they ended up laughing. Here though, Joel is free to do what he wants, and he'll do whatever he wants to get Ellie back. Now let's play the scenes from the game and show you how stuff lines up. <coughs> oh, leave him alone. Oh. You're next. <coughs> Oh, please. I don't know any girl. Is she alive? What girl? I don't know no girl. Ah! Ah, Jesus! Ah! Marco. Oh, no, 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 no. Fuck! Focus right here. Right here. And I'll pop your goddamn knee off. You focus right here. Or I'll pop your fucking kneecap off. The girl. Ah. She's alive. She's alive. Where? 
Where? Uh, 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 in the town. In the town. Ah, uh, the town. What town? Silver Lake. Now you're gonna mark it on the map. You're gonna point to where we are and where your resort is. And it better be the same exact spot your buddy points to. And it better be the exact same spot your buddy points to. Mark it. It's right there. You can verify it. Go ask him. Go ask him. He'll tell you I'm not lying. I ain't telling you shit. It's okay. No. I believe him. No. I ain't telling you shit. That's all right. I believe him. No, wait! We also get a follow-up from this with Ellie and a moment that builds upon the original. I know you're hungry. I've been out for quite some time. What is it? It's deer. For what it's worth, this is just deer meat, I swear. It's just the deer meat. You're a fucking animal. You're gonna chop me up into little pieces. So now what? You're gonna chop me up into tiny pieces? <laughs> I'd rather not. I'd rather not. Please, just tell me your name. Please tell me your name. You're so full of shit. If you want to judge me... Judge you? You're eating people, you sick fuck! It's awfully quick to judgment. Considering you and your friend killed how many men? It's the only way I'm going to be able to convince the others. Convince them of what? That you can come around. You have heart. You're loyal. And you're special. You're smart. Loyal. Oh. In the life we could build. You little c What am I supposed to tell the others now? Let's see what I go tell the others now. Ellie. What? Ellie. What? Tell them that Ellie is the little girl. Tell them that Ellie is the little girl who broke your fucking finger! I broke your fucking finger! How did you put it? Hmm? Tiny pieces. How did you put it? Hmm? Tiny little pieces? Ellie realizing their cannonballs is so chilling because they mistake and it was a mistake getting Ellie caged like this. This picturesque last resort on the world has turned into something where people have turned to cannibalism as a last resort and... What did the frustrated cannibal do? He threw up his hands. <laughs> now David recognises the violent heart within Ellie, and he even talks about how Cordyceps showed him the truth of the world. It feeds and protects its children, and he thinks that it actually loves. Now we realise at this point that the religion thing's a charade, and that he lets others believe it because it brings them comfort. However, it also brings people closer to him, and though he won't admit it, it allows him to be propped up. Now, the Cordyceps loving is something that the show's creators have talked about on the podcast and even said that they had the kiss with Tess to hammer home this idea. Love is laced throughout every aspect of the show and we've seen both the positives and negatives of it. You have people like Bill and Frank and the couple in episode 6, but then you have people like Kathleen and Joel who it just causes pain for. David has a sick and twisted kind of love and when he's assaulting Ellie later on, he creepily says, don't be afraid, there's no fear in love. Now, the Cordyceps have very much made him believe that his sick and twisted view of the world is the right one, and it's a chilling way to portray the character. Although his plan with Ellie fails, it's likely that he would have got her into the camp had things not got awry. Everyone was just silent about him, I doubt they would have spoken up, and thus he probably could have got her as one of the members. 
Taking out Joel would have helped him because he was the only person defending him and I doubt the other villagers would have been like, yeah Ellie's my friend, especially after this stuff with the university. Thus Ellie would have been alone and what people tend to do in abusive relationships is that they get people away from their friends and family. Thus they have no one to fall back on and with his safety gone, they can fully manipulate the person and control every aspect of their life. Now back with Joel we see as the storm rolls in and he makes his way to Salt Lake. This is a similar thing to the game and at this point you're able to mask your movements by using the environment. Now inside a hut there he discovers belongings and bodies hanging up which is similar to what happens when you enter one in the game. You find Ellie's backpack which is ripped right out of it too and he realises just how much trouble she's in. Now the episode in general, it reminded me a lot of the movie The Road and which characters also come across cannibals in that. Also, it's important to bear in mind that James is comfortable doing this with the chopping board, probably because he's helped David kill people like this before. In the game, he even refers to Ellie as David's new pet, showing how he views her. And we then get Ellie's escape in another scene that's ripped right out of the game. Wakey, wakey! Come on! Let's go! Stop! I warned you. Wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't do it. Please don't do it. Please don't. You had your chance. No. I'm infected. I'm infected. No, I'm infected. I'm infected. Really? So are you. <laughs> and now so are you. Really? So are you. Roll on my sleeve. Look at it. Look at it! Right there. Roll on my sleeve. Look at it! I'll play along. What'd you say? What did you say? Everything happens for a reason, right? Everything happens for a reason, right? What the hell is that? No, she would have turned by now. This isn't real. She would have turned by now. It can't be real. Looks pretty fucking real to me. Looks pretty fucking real to me. Now you might be asking whether Ellie biting someone can actually infect them and there's a bit in the second game that clears this up. I'll talk about that in the super spoiler section, 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 but we do kind of know the answer to it. Either way, they cut the sections down here and compress the scene so that Ellie goes immediately into the restaurant. In the game, you made your way through the town and jump back and forth between Joel and Ellie. I think it's actually smarter to handle it like this, and we see Ellie throwing a burning log which ends up setting the place on fire. In the game, as you went to escape, David grabbed you, and eventually this knocked over a lamp which then started the blaze. The several lines from the game are pulled directly across here. No way out, Ellie. The doors are locked, and I have the keys. Nowhere to go. You want out? You're gonna have to come get these keys. Now, Ellie burning down this quote-unquote church also symbolically shows how she's burning down the facade of everything David's built. The pair battle it out with one another, and the struggle ends up being exactly like how it is in the game. It's okay. 
Okay, baby girl. I got you. During David's death, we keep the focus on Ellie and it shows how much overkill she's giving to this wicked and evil man. Charles comforts her and we get a really important line dropped here where he calls her baby girl. This is the same nickname that he gave to Sarah and at this point he's all in on this being his daughter. The pair walk off together with his arm around her and this is a complete opposite to how they were in episode 2. After Tessa's death, Joel stormed away leaving Ellie, whereas here we see them closer than they've ever been. The pair have bonded over everything and whereas she once was just cargo, here he's putting a coat around her to let her know everything's okay. And that closes out the episode and we once more get a shot of the pair walking away. This is imagery that's often used in the show and game and it stages the characters are going on the next part of their journey. Now before we get into the spoiler section, I'll give my review and I thought this episode was really solid with some great performances in it. Scott Shepard brought a lot to David and at points he was even creepier than Nolan North. In the game things are, are a lot more implied but there was some extra lines of dialogue that they added which really freaked me out. Now it was also really nice seeing Troy Baker too and he gave a lot away from just minor facial expressions. Guy looked completely beaten up at points and his meek performance made me think that he very much represented the town's citizens who refused to confront David. I think this episode worked really well as an evolution of Ellie as well and it's no coincidence that this is the chapter in the game where you first take control of her. Like that section, this is very much about her having to fight to survive without help from others. So far she's relied on people like Fedra, Riley, Marlene, Joel, Tess and Henry and Sam but this is her showing that when she's cornered she can handle things that come her way. You also see that the character is realising that this world isn't as fun as it's cracked up to be. Going back to that opening in episode 3, we've seen how she thought wielding a gun was something cool and also exciting. Here though we have her smashing David's head and like it's a like button and we see the relentless anger that she carries. Huge change in dynamic and her growth as a character. Now as for what I didn't like, you already know what I'm going to say and I think the show has continued to underuse the infected which has taken away from some of the most memorable scenes of the game. I think if we had something with David where they had to fight some of them, it would have made that turn as impactful as it is in the game and with the episode just being 45 minutes long, I think we could have easily have gotten another 10 or even 5 minutes where we had something like that play out. I'm guessing that they've pulled back on showing the infected as much because of the budget but every week it seems like there's a major moment involving them which is left on the cutting room floor. Minor nitpick and yeah obviously the game's there if you want to see more of them but I did kind of want an action scene like that with Ellie so we could see what she was capable of against humans and also the infected. Now that takes us into the super spoiler section and for the next part of the video I want to go over some of the easter eggs that will probably give the game away. If you don't want things spoiled then thanks for watching, thanks a lot mate again for wasting 40 minutes of your life and uh, I hope to see you back for the finale next week. Now the first thing I want to talk about is the interrogation technique. In part 2 Ellie also ends up using this and we of course needed to see her actually see it for herself in order to explain how she knows this. We also discover that Silver Lake is a resort rather than just being a town. I wonder if this line was thrown to show how resorts have changed across the country as part 2 ends with Ellie going to a resort on the hunt for Abby. This was controlled by slavers and you can see how these holiday locations have been twisted in this new world. Now lastly is Ellie biting David. Was he infected? Was he not? We don't fully know, however Ellie does end up kissing Dina in the second game and at one point she also bites Abby when she's fighting her in the theatre. As we know Abby doesn't get infected and thus I don't think that Ellie's bite actually could infect people. The infection seems to have stopped at her arm and not made its way to her saliva glands and thus I don't think she passes it on. So I don't think Ellie actually infected David and either she didn't know or she used it as a weapon. Throughout the series she's been told to hide it from people but she pulls her down this moment to further sow doubt and confusion. This throws James off a bit and it adds upon what he was experiencing before allowing Ellie to escape. Anyway that wraps up the video and huge thank you for sticking with me until the end. I know I made a joke about it before but asking you guys to sometimes give up 40 minutes of your life to watch these things is a big ask and I appreciate you for sticking with me through it. Hopefully you've enjoyed the video and now I'd love to hear your thoughts on it in the comment section below. We are running a competition right now giving away 3 copies of the Rocky 4K box set on the 15th of March and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments out random at the end of the month and the winners of the last one are on screen right now so if that's you then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. 
You want some else to watch? We've got a very controversial video on screen right now. Can we forgive Abby? Definitely go head over there after this. Uh, if you're watching this part of the video, you know what I'm talking about in that spoiler section. You'd have to go head over right after this. By the way, thanks for sitting through the video. I've been Paul, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.